Good evening. I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily for Tuesday, June 28th. Tonight, the Prime Minister defends Canadian military spending. This comes as a new NATO report shows the country is heading in the wrong direction. Canada and other members of the alliance agreed in 2014 to increase their defense spending to 2% of their national gross domestic product. But a report released by Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg estimates Canadian defense spending as a share of GDP will actually drop this year. Ahead of a NATO summit in Spain, Mr. Trudeau says Canada has repeatedly proven its commitment to the military alliance. Turning to the inquiry examining Ottawa's use of the Emergencies Act in February. Several groups have been granted full standing in the inquiry examining the act, which was used to bring an end to the so-called Freedom Convoy protest. Inquiry Commissioner Paul Rouleau has granted the status to all three levels of government, as well as police and convoy organizers. It means the parties will get advance notice of any evidence submitted to the inquiry and they will have the opportunity to suggest or cross-examine witnesses. Meanwhile, experts say Canada should be prepared for a potential rise in medical tourism as abortion becomes banned in some states. The U.S. Supreme Court ruling is expected to lead to abortion bans in roughly half the country. This includes some along the U.S.-Canada border. The decision has raised concerns among some abortion providers and advocates about how a possible influx of Americans could impact Canada's system. Jill Doktoroff, the executive director of National Abortion Federation Canada, says the effort and expense involved in procuring a passport and traveling to Canada will likely be prohibitive for marginalized Americans who are most affected by abortion bans. Scotiabank says it's pausing its sponsorship of Hockey Canada. This until it's confident that the right steps are taken to improve the sport's culture. It comes after the federal government froze public funding to the organization last week. This was in response to its handling of an alleged sexual assault. Hockey Canada quietly settled a lawsuit last month. This was after a woman claimed she was assaulted by members of the country's 2018 gold medal winning World Junior Hockey team. None of the allegations have been proven in court. On the West Coast, the provincial and federal governments have announced more than $31 million in funding for improvements in public transit across British Columbia. The upgrades will include the construction of a new expanded transit exchange in Nelson with up to five bus bays and transit bus shelters. And it will expand the current fleet to serve more commuters in several communities, which include Central Fraser Valley, Kamloops, Kelowna and Victoria. To the east, the federal government is injecting more than $221 million to help Quebec long-term care homes. Federal Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos says the funding is part of the $1 billion, which was set aside in the federal government's 2020 fall economic statement. Quebec's long-term care homes were particularly hard hit at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. This with almost 4,000 deaths between March 2020 and June 2020. They accounted for nearly 70 percent of the deaths reported in the province during the first wave. Moving to Saskatchewan now, where the newly elected NDP opposition leader says she is prepared to run the tires off her car in order to visit every corner of the province. Carla Beck won the job on Sunday and led her first caucus meeting yesterday. Then she announced that she is embarking on a three-week tour of Saskatchewan with her fellow New Democrat MLAs. Her trip is to include branding cows in southeast Saskatchewan and visiting indigenous communities in the north. This is all to engage with people on ways the NDP can move Saskatchewan forward. A new poll suggests that a slim majority of Canadians don't think people should have to swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen. An online survey of more than 2,000 people this month, conducted by Liget, found that 56% of respondents do not agree with swearing allegiance to the Queen. It's something that new Canadians must do when they take an oath of citizenship. In Manitoba, paramedics are stepping in to fill some staffing holes at a Winnipeg emergency department. The chief operating officer at Winnipeg's Health Sciences Centre says it's been routine practice in other Manitoba facilities. But this past weekend was the first time off-duty paramedics were asked to work in the ER. The Manitoba government and General Employees Union are concerned about paramedic burnout and spreading the profession too thin. 
Up next, we take a look at the initiative in Nova Scotia to have Ottawa implement a basic income across Canada. Stay with us. We'll be right back on Forum Daily News. Halifax Regional Council is discussing the idea of a federal guaranteed basic income. Councillor Way Mason brought forward the issue and wants a letter sent to the Prime Minister and Premier to request the implementation of a basic income to bolster the social safety net. A report released earlier this month found income support would reduce inequality, establish a sense of financial security, and encourage savings. Well, joining us now to give us deeper insight into what a guaranteed federal basic income would look like is Dr. Elizabeth K. Raining Bird, Chair of Basic Income Nova Scotia and a member of the Steering Committee of Coalition Canada Basic Income. She's joined by Pierre Stevens, a member of Basic Income Nova Scotia and a retired senior instructor at Dalhousie University. Welcome to Forum Daily. So, Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with uh, this motion itself put forward by Mr. Mason. What exactly is he asking for and what would this program look like in Nova Scotia? Uh, Councillor Mason is requesting that the mayor write letters to the prime minister, to the premier of Nova Scotia and to ministers. And uh, the letters would be requesting that the governments implement a basic income uh, throughout Canada. And what would a realistic uh, federal basic income look like throughout Canada? Who would qualify for it? Um, the, the request is being made to uh, provide a regular payment made to people who need it and distributed with minimal bureaucracy. What that would do would be to dramatically reduce um, poverty in Nova Scotia and throughout Canada, improve the physical and uh, mental health of individuals who are currently living in poverty and uh, increase people's sense of well-being and actually trust in government. Now, on the other, uh, on the other hand, I want to jump to a recent report by Atlantic Province's Economic Council. Uh, it indicates that guaranteed basic income would require higher taxes or cutting government spending, which could involve cuts to social programs. So how could officials implement a basic income program without impacting certain groups? Uh, advocates throughout uh, Canada, including here in Nova Scotia and the Atlantic provinces, uh, are advocating for a basic income that would not replace uh, the social programs. It would become an important component of a comprehensive uh, social safety net. So uh, the claim by APEC that it would replace social programs is unsubstantiated. And uh, the second aspect of that question, the question about taxes, uh, is an interesting one. Um, higher taxes are not always a bad thing. Um, our taxation system over the past number of years, past number of decades, has become less and less equitable. Um, and, and if we were to modify our taxation system to become fairer and for the wealthy and corporations to pay their fair share, then that would generate a, a, a tremendous amount of money uh, to support a basic income. So uh, let's stay on the topic of these higher taxes. What would these taxes look like and who would these taxes impact the most? They certainly wouldn't impact people who are poor or people who uh, are middle income. They would impact people who have uh, a lot of money already and can afford to uh, increase their taxes. Um, we don't know exactly what the taxes, uh, any changes in taxes might mean. Um, it, it's possible that they could take a lot of different forms. UBI Works, for example, has proposed that uh, there's a variety of funding options uh, that could be made. We could um, increase contributions by the, from the financial sector. We could uh, provide fewer tax breaks for big companies. We could provide fewer subsidies for the wealthiest people in Canada. All of these 
people fear taxation. Um, I want to emphasize, however, that we really don't know right now how the government would fund uh, basic income. Many programs that are funded are funded uh, with deficit funding. For example, the um, Canada Child Benefit was funded with deficit funding. And after it was implemented, it actually generated uh, economic gains for uh, the country. So, so it is quite possible that we don't need to modify the taxation system to create a basic income. Some really interesting points to consider, Dr. Ray K, uh, Dr. K. Rainingbird and Mr. Stevens. Uh, just about 10 seconds left here, so I'm going to leave it at that. But we'll definitely have to return to talk about this important topic. Thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Well, thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Last Friday's Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade continues to face backlash in the form of protests and a wave of litigation across the U.S. Much of Monday's court activity focused on trigger laws which have been adopted in 13 states and were designed to take effect swiftly after the ruling. Overall, 26 states are certain or at least likely to fully ban abortion. Well, joining us now to talk more about the overall impact of abortion bans is Dr. Liza Fuentes, senior research scientist at the Guttmacher Institute, specializing in the evaluation of abortion restrictions. Dr. Fuentes, welcome to Forum Daily. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, your organization points to decades of research, which indicates that abortion bans and restrictions don't actually reduce unintended pregnancies or the overall demand for abortion. So what can these restrictions lead women to do in such situations? When people are seeking abortion care in highly restrictive places, as many states in the United States are, and now that Roe versus Wade is overturned, even more so, um, or they have to travel very far to even find a clinic that offers abor abortion care. And in those cases, we see several outcomes. First, people already struggling to make ends meet uh, have often delayed care because it takes time, sometimes weeks, to gather the money and resources like childcare and transportation to even attend an appointment. And those delays add costs. Um, and even though abortion is extremely safe, added risk because every further along a pregnancy gets, um, the more expensive it is and there are some minor risks that accrue. Um, second, we also may see some people who are struggling to afford abortion care to forego an abortion altogether because as they are working to obtain care, they time out and are unable to obtain an abortion at all. Um, this means involuntarily taking on the added risks of pregnancy. Pregnancy is um, Continuing a pregnancy is more dangerous than an abortion, and an abortion is safer, even safer than riding a bike. Um, finally, some people who cannot afford to travel to a clinic may try to self-manage an abortion, for example, by obtaining uh, medications for abortion without the help of a clinician. And while self-managed abortion with appropriate medications is very safe, now that Roe is overturned, we fear that people who choose to self-manage abortion um, are at greater risk of being involved with the criminal justice system, or maybe perhaps people who help them. Um, with people living with low incomes, immigrants, and people of color most at risk for that. And Guttmacher also highlights the impact of forced pregnancies. So can you tell us a little bit more about your research into this? Sure. Our research is grounded in advancing the ability of everyone to decide whether, when, and how to become pregnant and become a parent. So to that end, we have found that the vast majority, if not all, legal restrictions on abortion in the United States are not grounded in any medical evidence, do not improve safety, and do not ensure high quality care, but rather they impose added costly barriers that can sometimes end up denying people care altogether. And as I said, imposing delays, even if they do obtain care, um, thereby denying pregnant people and their families the ability to care for themselves um, and often the children they have. And it's notable um, that our research shows that 60% of people seeking abortion care are already parents. And abortion patients note being able to take care of the children they already have as one of the reasons for seeking abortion care. And a lot's happening uh, down in the United States. We know the midterm elections are upcoming and lawmakers are discussing supports for vulnerable mothers and children. So staying on that point, what do we know so far about current social programs for such demographics? Yeah, well, states that have sought to highly restrict abortion and now are looking to ban abortion are the states that often have the worst maternal and child health outcomes um, and have the 
um, the most flimsy and thin social programs to support people um, with regard to things like paid parental leave and other social programs. And just for a case in point, in the um, case that was just argued and decided to overturn Roe, Dobbs versus Jackson's home, Jackson Women's Health Organization. Um, that case was originated in Mississippi that wanted to ban abortion at 15 weeks and they have, um, they rank 50th in, in maternal mortality. So they're really, um, the correlation between banning abortion um, and restricting abortion um, and social safety networks and maternal and child health is inverse. And so we really don't find evidence that states that are looking to ban and restrict abortion are motivated to support the health and well being of families and children. All right, Dr. Fuentes, a quick 45 seconds left here, but there are concerns around unsafe and illegal abortions. You spoke a little bit more about that, or a little bit about that earlier in this interview. Uh, tell us a little bit more about these procedures and how they impact maternal deaths. Well, uh I know we only have 45 seconds, but I'll just say that today having uh, Roe overturned is different than before Roe. We have medication abortion. It's incredibly safe. And we know that when people are given the proper instructions, they know how to use it. That's not to say that there will be some people who may try other methods that are less safe. And likely what will happen is that they won't be able to successfully have an abortion. And we may see some people who may end up um, harmed. Um, but with medication abortion, we hope to mitigate that because self-managed abortion with medications are, um, in fact, very safe. Leaders of the world's wealthiest democracies say they'll explore far-reaching steps to cap Russia's income from oil sales. These sales are financing the country's invasion of Ukraine. The final statement from the Group of Seven Summit in Germany underlines the leaders' intent to impose what they call severe and immediate economic costs on Russia. It leaves out key details on how the fossil fuel price caps would work in practice, but it sets up more discussion in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has said that Russia cannot and should not win the war in Ukraine. The president's comments on Tuesday come one day after a Russian missile attack on a crowded shopping mall that killed 18 people in Ukraine. Ukrainian and Western leaders have denounced the strike as a war crime and a terrorist attack. Mr. Macron vowed that the seven industrialized democracies would support Ukraine and maintain sanctions against Russia for as long as necessary. Turning to Texas now, where authorities say 51 people have been found dead after being abandoned in a tractor trailer on a remote back road. 16 others were hospitalized, including four children. San Antonio's fire chief says those taken to hospital were hot to the touch and dehydrated, and no water was found in the trailer. It is the latest tragedy to claim the lives of migrants smuggled across the border from Mexico to the United States. Well, ahead of the NATO summit in Spain, the Secretary General of NATO spoke on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He says it has sparked a fundamental shift in the alliance's approach to defense. Jens Stoltenberg says member states will have to boost their military spending in an increasingly unstable world. NATO leaders have begun to arrive in Madrid for a summit that will set the course of the alliance for the coming years. Just nine of NATO's 30 members meet the organization's target of spending 2 percent of gross domestic product on defense. Turning to Scotland now, where the country's leader says she plans to hold a new independence referendum on October 19th of next year. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says the question will be the same as it was in the 2014 vote. Should Scotland be an independent country? Scottish voters rejected independence in that referendum, with 55% saying they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom. The UK government of Prime Minister Boris Johnson opposes a new referendum, saying the issue was settled in the 2014 vote. Senior Biden administration officials have quietly traveled to Caracas. This comes in the latest bid to rebuild relations with the South American oil giant. As the war in Ukraine drags on, it is driving higher gas prices and forcing the U.S. to recalibrate other foreign policy objectives. The delegation includes Ambassador James Story, who heads the U.S. government's Venezuelan Affairs Unit out of neighboring Colombia. Roger Carstens, the special presidential envoy on hostage affairs, is also part of the group. Tragedy in Colombia, as dozens of people have died in a fire at a prison in the country's southwest. 
The president of the country is expressing condolences to the families of the victims. Ivan Duque says he has ordered an investigation into the cause of the fire that claimed at least 51 lives. The director of Colombia's national prison system says the blaze broke out during an attempted riot in which inmates had set mattresses on fire. All right, well, meanwhile, Facebook and Instagram have begun removing posts offering abortion pills to women. The posts were targeting those who may not be able to access them following the U.S. Supreme Court decision to strip away constitutional protections for the procedure. Memes and status updates offered to mail the prescriptions to women living in a state that has banned the procedure. The platform's parent company, Meta, says it has a policy against gifting or selling pharmaceutical drugs. A new study has given scientists their first ever direct link between a person's vitamin D levels and their risk of conditions such as dementia or strokes. Researchers from the University of South Australia looked at nearly 300,000 UK residents. They found that low levels of vitamin D, commonly known as the sunshine vitamin, were associated with lower brain volumes and an increased risk of stroke or dementia. More than 55 million people suffer from dementia globally, and the study says that new cases of dementia could drop by nearly a fifth if people who are vitamin D deficient take supplements or spend more time in the sun. The study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for more news on demand, you can always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and make sure to follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care, Canada. We'll see you next time on Forum Daily News.